Right now, Zach Rosenblatt, who covers the 76ers, joins us after a nice win last night, Zach. Uh, you know, I had somebody tell me that the loss on Sunday was apocalyptic, and I was like, whoa, so what comes after an apocalyptic loss? Like a 10-game losing streak, like they don't make the playoffs. No, nope, they go on the road and win, and uh, you kind of forget about that loss. But it's kind of just a microcosm of the season. One night they're up, the next night they look really good. But uh, they're going to have to play more nights like last night if they want to continue to solidify their seeding in the East. Yeah, for sure. I think they're, they're probably somewhere in between those two games. Uh, I mean, as we've talked about before, they're, they're a young team that's still learning how to win. So they're, they're not going to be great every game. And, you know, it is funny how every time they do have a bad loss, the, it's, everybody thinks the wheels are falling off and then they come right back and have maybe the most productive game of the season. And that's with Joel Embiid not having his best night. They scored 128 points. They had like 71 at halftime. They had 100 through three quarters. Uh, they're, they're looking good right now. Any win they can get on the road is good because they haven't done very well on the road so far this year. Yeah, and uh, last night, you know, they did it with um, a couple of different things. I thought Ben Simmons had a really good game, but Robert Covington uh, really, you know, had one of his best nights really since, I don't know, going back to December almost, uh, that, that Covington has not put together nights on both ends of the floors. And, I don't know, you're around him a lot. Do you sense that he was kind of in a funk or down a little bit? And did you sense that maybe he's coming around a little bit? I That definitely was an encouraging game. He, uh, you know, even through his struggles, you know, you, you mentioned offense and defense. He hasn't done as much on offense. He's still been really good at defense. And so that's why it, I don't know if it necessarily just being around him and talking to him and talking to Brett Brown. I don't know if it necessarily felt like he was in, in a slump, you know, just in general. But uh, he obviously wasn't making a shot. Uh, and they need him to because they, they don't really but before the especially before they added Ilias to and Bellinelli they didn't really have other shooters so the fact that he is making those and they have those guys coming off the bench if, if they can keep that up they're they're going to be you know really dangerous come playoff time. Uh, Zach Rosenblatt here with us on the Sports Best covers the Sixers for NJ.com New Jersey Advanced Media. Uh, you wrote about the possibility of Markel Fultz returning this season. Before we dive into that a little deeper, what chance do you think there is for him to return this season? Or is there a cutoff point where they say, look, he's done, it's, there's not enough time left, or does it not matter at all if he's ready at some point that they'll use him? You know, it's a good question because there's only 19 games left, which is not a lot of time to reintegrate a player like Markel, who, you know, needs to have the ball to be effective pretty much and hasn't played all year, and, you know, they have two new players, they have you know they have a good flow going they everybody knows their role and he kind of he there's a chance he would throw it for a loop a little bit but so you would think it's already too late if not maybe that's coming soon but you you ask Brett Brown or you know Colangelo when we talked to him the one time and they they insist that they're still discussing that so if if that's true and they don't actually they still haven't decided then that that means there still is at least a chance that he comes back I, I still don't think he does I think you unless they're like confident that he's capable of being the Mark L. Fultz that they drafted. I, I just don't see the value in, in throwing him into the fire with less than 20 games to go. Zach, a two-part question here. One, do you expect a decision by the Sixers soon on what's going on with Fultz, if they're going to shut him down for the year or if they're going to leave that window open for him to come back? And two, is it telling that they really haven't officially shut him down yet because they're still holding out hope that they could bring him back this year? Yeah, I, I think, you know, to the latter part, I think that that is an indication that they're at least, you know, leaving the possibility open. I, it wouldn't surprise me if internally they already even decided that he's not playing. And for Markel's sake, they're kind of, you know, letting him think that they're going to let him come back. Because you, you don't want a guy who's healthy to just – you don't want to really shut that guy down. You you want him to, you know, keep working hard and get back to where he was. So it doesn't it, – mentally, he, it's not another hurdle he has to get over. So it's it's entirely possible they've already decided that he's not – Coming back, I don't know if they've made that decision. Uh, he certainly looked better shooting the ball. We've seen him lately. He's shooting three pointers the other day, but we also haven't seen him going against any actual defenders, and I haven't really seen him do any catch and shoot. So I think they're still maybe a couple weeks away from him being ready to play in a game. But the fact that they haven't announced anything, you know, that I mean that, that at, at the very least that leaves a percentage chance that he's coming back. What would it take for this organization to see from him? You just alluded to him shooting threes yesterday, and I've watched every video that he's done pregame and, and uh, shoot around and everything. What would it take for this organization to see from him for them to say, okay, it's time to end all this long drama 
you know, he can go out there and play? Or is it that no matter what they see from him, they just think it's beneficial for them to do the whole Simmons and Bede Noel thing where he's going to sit out the rest of the year no matter what, and then we'll debut him next year as a better NBA player? I think more than anything, it comes down to confidence. If they can see in his eyes and the way he talks and the, his body language, and I know they study all these things and they look really closely because they're very deep into that kind of thing. If they, if they look at him and see a guy who can go out there and play with confidence and you know be a threat to shoot the ball, even if he doesn't shoot it, if he can just be a threat that he's going to shoot it, you know I, I think that's when they they give him the go ahead. You know they, they, he's been playing in five and fives uh, since I believe since January, maybe even earlier than that, and they they kind of found a loophole so he doesn't have to talk to us, so they keep him out of one thing every day, but. Uh, and I just think if he if he shows in those especially in those five and five drills when he's going against other players that he's confident and you know willing to at least make the defender think he's going to shoot it, then I think he could. I mean, he he brings something that the Sixers kind of need. You know, CJ McConnell is great, but he he can't doesn't really score off the dribble. He doesn't create shots for himself. He's more of a create shots for everybody else. And Markel would add a lot of flexibility on defense, even if he's not scoring. He's six foot five at the seven foot wingspan, which is pretty ridiculous. So. He, he he would add value, and he adds something that they're kind of missing. And you, you see it in their losses when they turn the ball over a lot, and they don't really have a, a guard option who's good at handling the ball. So he, he would add some value there. But if he's not doesn't have any confidence, then he wouldn't add any value anywhere. So I, I think they're just gonna have to go with their gut and see how he, how he sounds, how he how he acts, and how he feels. Zach Rosenblatt's on the Boardwalk Honda Hotline. He writes about Markel Fultz. Um, you, you wrote about you know how the rotation might look like you know. 19 games, it's about a quarter of the season still. So, I, I mean, I guess they could integrate integrate him in there somehow, uh, even if there's, you know, 15, 10 games left, see what he's got. I mean, because you're right, he adds something that they don't have. You People ask me all the time, why do they blow so many of these big leads? My answer really, Zach, a lot of times to these people is they don't have a guy that can create. You know, and you rely on the jump shot like this team does so much. Even if you said to Markel, look, we just want you to take the ball to the basket just so that you give us some kind of – it's like a pitcher, a young kid who all he does is throw 85 miles an hour and he has no secondary pitch. And you're like, you got to show something different because eventually they know a fastball is coming. The Sixers don't have that secondary pitch. So I would be a fan of seeing Markel play regardless of when he is, is eligible. But where – would you see he fits in rotationally on this current team, adding Bellinelli and now with Urson? That rotation seems to be getting a little tighter. Yeah, you know, it's, that's, that'll be the biggest question because, you know, Brett has pretty clearly established who his nine or ten guys are. And in the bench, you know, Bellinelli has been the sixth man. Ily Sova has been the top backup big man. And then McConnell has been the other major backup. And uh, my, my guess would be is he would cut into McConnell's playing time rather significantly if he were to come back. It, this all depends on if they – if, if Markel's back and he's his full self and he's at his full capability, he might play quite a bit because he's he maybe the third most talented guy in the roster in that scenario. So it's it just such a weird thing to like think about. So I kind of average it out, and I think my prediction was that if he were back, he'd probably average out to around like 15 to 20 minute per game range, uh, just because of what he adds on the defensive side and how he can dribble the ball. But you know, it could it could fluctuate if he if he goes out there and he doesn't. And he's not shooting the ball, and he's turning the ball over a lot. Then it'll, then that number will go down. If if he comes down, he looks like the guy they drafted. Then that number will go up, and then you might even see some different lineups where he's starting, and they have Robert Covington as a stretch four, and Dario Saric as a six man. You know, there's a lot of interesting things that could happen if he's his full self. But if he's not his full self, I don't really see him play very much. Does T.J. McConnell's play factor into this at all? Because he has struggled the last couple of games, and I've maintained that once this team gets into the playoffs, as good as McConnell is with the ball in his hands, making plays for other people, they're going to force him to score, and that's not McConnell's forte. Yeah, I I don't know. I don't think necessarily McConnell. I think everything with Markell is independent of everything else going on with the team. But you know, as I pointed out in the article that you mentioned, uh, McConnell. You know, we, we're talking about Markell not being willing to shoot three pointers. T.J. McConnell didn't shoot a single three pointer the other day. He's averaging less than one per game this season, and he's averaging more than 20. He's in the 20 to 25 minute per game range. So clearly, I mean, obviously, we all know what McConnell brings as more than scoring and shooting. He brings energy, toughness, defense, all that stuff. But the fact that he's he's still been pretty productive for them without shooting threes shows you that if Markel comes out there and plays with some energy, he probably 
brings more to the table, even without shooting the ball, than McConnell in theory does. And that, that's kind of why I, I feel like if Markel plays, it probably cuts into TJ's minutes a little bit. My last thing is that a lot of fans have kind of been tweeting at me. I put a, uh, you know, a question out there, should Markel come back if he is, you know, his normal self shooting? And a lot of people say, you know, no, because there's no place for him. I've watched a lot of Markel from last season. And when you watch him, he's a guy that as soon as he touches the ball, he's a threat to shoot it anywhere. You know, he can step step back, shoot off the dribble. If he's back, he's really your third most important player. It shouldn't matter whose minutes he's cutting in. Am I correct? Yeah. I mean, like I mentioned, you know, he might be the third most talented player right now. And if he, you know, I had a scout tell me back in January, even while the shooting stuff was going on, I asked him what his, like, evaluation was of Markel coming out of college. And he said he he's – his ability to score the ball in so many different ways is like something he's never seen coming out of college. He, he, he didn't directly compare it to Kobe Bryant, but he said Kobe Bryant had that, you know, I can score from anywhere on the floor. You don't really know what move I'm going to do. I can shoot with either hand. I can, I can do this. I can, you know, get to the rim. I can pull up, I can fade away. And the fact that, like you mentioned, you know, they don't have a guy that Joel Embiid wants to be that guy, but he, he's still a seven foot two, 270 pounder. And that kind of leads to a lot of turnovers when he tries to do that. And, Dario Saric has been a lot better than any of us probably thought he would. He, he can create his own shot quite well for a six foot ten guy, but he doesn't really have any, have much athleticism, you know. So Markel just brings something that not only the Sixers don't have, but most teams don't when he's fully healthy. So if if he's if he's capable of being Markel Fultz, then you play him because that's that's like adding an All Star caliber player twenty games before the playoffs. Let's simplify some things here with uh, Markel. I, I I know you wrote about this. Um, you've taken a lot of videos. Zach Rosenblatt's with us, covers the Sixers for NJ.com. Would you deem that his shot is progressing to the point where health is not a question? You mean in terms of, like, his shoulder being a factor kind of thing? Yes. Yeah, I I think it's – I can't say that with 100% authority, but I think it's pretty safe to say that you can just see, you know, just in the short amount of time we've seen him in the last couple weeks – and you mentioned some of the videos that posted. It, he doesn't seem to have that hitch that he had before. And I think that probably was partially due to the shoulder soreness. Uh, and, I, you know, we, we, we see him, you know, he, he had that shot where he threw it over his head full court and went in. And I just think there's a lot of little things that kind of indicate that maybe his shoulder isn't bothering him as much anymore. Now it's just about getting back to where he's comfortable with shooting the ball. Okay. So we know uh, you wrote the question number two you write is what would he add? My question on that is what he brings to the team, is it enough to get them further in the playoffs than maybe the team thinks they can get without him? In other words, is he a difference maker of them getting out of the first round or the second? I mean, are they an Eastern Conference Finals team if they add a piece like him? I think that's a good question. You know, I'd say probably – I don't know how if he necessarily moves the needle this season – in terms of them beating a team like... In other words, you know, is that a reason why they would say, you know what, we're no better, we're not getting any farther with them, we might as well just play it safe? Yeah, yeah, no, that's a great way of putting it. Uh, I don't know if they'll think about it like that. Uh, I, I th- they, they seem pretty intent on winning as many games as they can, uh, especially in the playoffs. So if, if they feel like he can help them, I think they'll let him play. But yeah, like you said, I, I don't I don't necessarily believe he's going to be the difference between them beating the Cavaliers or not. I think LeBron James is the difference between them beating the Cavaliers or not. If they're the four or the five or the six seed or the seven seed and they, or if they're the, the four, five or six and they play somebody like the Pacers or the Wizards in the first round, he can certainly make a difference in that scenario. But if they could rise as high as three or they could stay at six and play somebody like the Cavaliers, like there's just so many factors. I don't think they'll think about it like that. But uh, yeah, I, I don't personally think he's going to be the difference between them going to the Eastern Conference Finals or going to the second round. Uh, I, I think they can make it to the second round. I, I don't know if they're quite at the level yet where they can go beyond that, but they're they're certainly certainly in good shape, that's for sure. Because uh, when you write about what a, uh, an Eastern Conference scout told you, and you can share that with our listeners, Zach, uh, this sounds like a player that's a difference maker in, in the eyes of scouts. Now, I don't know if they still feel that he can translate into that player, uh, but what they told you about him back in January, what they thought of him, sounds like a guy who's an impact, an instant impact player. Yeah, that was, you know, people, it, it, it's, people are quick to forget just, you know, that Markel Fultz was the consensus number one overall pick. Like, the Sixers weren't the only team that were going to take him number one. The majority of teams, if they had number one pick, were taking Markel Fultz there. The Celtics can pretend like they were going to take Jason Tatum, but I don't believe that. And there's a reason why. You know, he... 
he, he has, like I mentioned, you know, he has a skill set that not many guys do. He, he has length that guys that, that can play point guard and shooting guard just don't have. He's six foot five with a seven foot wingspan and he, he has really good athleticism and he plays hard. Um, but yeah, that scoring ability is and, and the ability to create for himself is just something that the Sixers need right now. And if he can add that, then that would certainly be very beneficial. Okay, uh, Zach Rosenblatt's with us, NJ.com. Uh, that's uh, some updates on Markel Fultz. You can read his full piece. It's a really good one. Uh, seven questions uh, at NJ.com. Follow Zach uh, on Twitter. You can get it from following him there, at Zach Blatt. Uh, let's throw some other things into the question here. When you're around this team, do they have a goal of, we want to get to three, we just want to get into the playoffs? Do they – because – you lose the game at Miami, you lose that Washington game, you know, it seems like just getting into the playoffs seems to be okay some nights. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Uh, the way the way they talk, at least Joel Embiid has been pretty loudly saying, I want a home court advantage. And, you know, they, they talk pretty often about the advantage they have when they're at the Wells Fargo Center. You know, they, they, they're in the top five in the league in attendance, and that crowd has been pretty raucous from start to finish all year. You can see in their record they're better at home. Uh, you know, I, I think they want that. I, I don't know if they necessarily I, – I, it's funny because for the longest time they just talked about making the playoffs. We want to make the playoffs. And now that that's pretty much – it's not a guarantee, but it's pretty close to it just because of how bad the Pistons have been lately at, at the ninth spot. Uh, it it does seem like they do want that home court advantage. And even with those bad losses, you know, they're, they're still two only two games out of the three seed, I think even less than that out of the four. So if they just take care of business, they have, I think the easiest schedule going forward, winning on the road is hard regardless, and they're still on the road for the rest of this week and a couple games next week. So if they can you know, go 500 on the road, I think they're, they still have a chance at, at that. Zach, for the Fire Brett Brown crew, and there are some people on Twitter that, you know, the hashtag Fire Brett Brown, can you just speak to what it's meant for not only him, but to get this young team in the position to make the playoffs after all the years that he's been through with the process and stuff like that, really, this is the first year he's had talent, and they are, what, two games behind the three seed in the Eastern Conference? No matter what you want to say about the Eastern Conference, Brett Brown deserves some credit. Yeah, and even beyond that, as I've come on here and talked about in the past, they're top five in offensive and defensive rating, I believe, and they have the most productive starting five in, in the entire league. And, you know, you mentioned how what it's like for Brett Brown. I I was just watching the game last night, and at one point they went up by a lot. The Hornets started taking out their players, and I can just kind of see Brett trying to hold back a smile. You know, he's he's been through a lot, like you mentioned. Yeah, he has. I think he probably had the worst record to start his career in NBA history, and it wasn't for any fault of his. And the team always played hard despite all of that. And now he has them playing well. A lot of that has to do with Joel Embiid being in the lineup, but he even in you know he struggled a little bit last night and the game he missed before before the All Star break that they won and. I, you know, obviously the Firebird Brown stuff is ridiculous. He's done a great job. I think if if they if they're the three seed at the end of the year, I think it'd be insane for Brett Brown not to be in the top three for Coach of the Year this year. Just you just consider everything they've been through, the improve, the vast improvement from last year, how, how they've done this year. Like it, I I just think it's I think he almost deserves more credit. And, and you see every time they've been signing these guys like Ilyasova and Bellinelli, and I even saw a quote from JJ Redick about wanting to stay here. Uh, the other day, they always reference how they wanted to play for Brett Brown. He's just so well liked around the league, and I think you know everybody wants him to be fired. But I think that's going to go. I mean, not everybody, but there's the segment in the fan base that does. And I think his likability and his smarts as a coach, I think it's going to go a long way when they're going after free agents like LeBron James in the future. Yeah, Zach, uh, I scratch my head some nights when I hear these people talk about the coach needing to be fired. But that being said, is there something that you think? he needs to do a better job at that something. I mean, cause he's not, I mean, there are nights where you're, you know, the, blowing big leads and they turn the ball over a lot. And I know a lot of people say the turnovers that's on the coach, these leads that's on the coach. Is there something that you think that he needs to improve on? That's hard to say. I, I don't, I don't actually believe the turnovers are his fault. I think it's the product of a young team. Like I've said, learning how to win and, uh, and not having that, that creator, you know, he's, you have to. We've talked about Markel Fultz this entire show. You have to remember he he has been coaching with his number one overall pick this entire year. Um, in terms of what he's proved, you know, maybe sometimes I don't agree with like his rotation decisions, and I think Rashawn Holmes maybe deserves a little more playing time than he gets. But you know, he's making a judgment call based on his defensive prowess, and he's a defensive-minded coach. So I, I mean, I even understand that playing Amir Johnson over him. So I, I don't know if there's necessarily anything he needs to improve on. I, I. 
I think he's pretty smart, and I think he knows what he's doing. Uh, you know, we're, the thing we'll really find out about what kind of coach he is when he has to coach in the playoffs against teams that he's seen, you know, five games in a row. And when it comes close and it's down to the wire, what kind of sets he throws out there, and how he puts Ben Simmons in the position to just to succeed despite not having the ability to shoot. I think that's when we find out just if Brett Brown is an elite coach or if he's a good coach for young players. All right. Uh, Zach Blatt, uh, uh, Zach Rosenblatt, follow him at, at Zach Blatt on Twitter. He appeared via the Boardwalk Conda Hotline. You can read his Sixers coverage at NJ.com. Sixers take on the Heat. Another uh, important game in the Eastern Conference playoff race is on the way, and you can hear that game tomorrow night on 97.3 ESPN. Zach, always a pleasure, pal. Enjoyed it. Yeah, thanks, Zach. Thanks, sir. Thanks, sir.